Hey everyone, as promised in the daily financial news this morning, we have four, yes, four, this is number three, interviews with students. We're going to see what's going on in their world, what questions they have, because I want to get better. I want to help more people move forward. And uh, if this interview, which I'm sure it will, will go like the other two, I learn just as much as the student. So let's welcome Ursula to the show. How are you doing, Ursula? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for signing up. This will be a lot of fun. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself first to the audience, where who you are, where you're at in this crazy world of real estate investing, and then we will get into your questions. So um, again, my name is Ursula. I'm currently in um, San Diego. I recently moved to the West Coast uh, from the East Coast, um, and which kind of, you know, it was so helpful to hear your story, Michael, because you're investing in an area where I was just like, I would never invest here. I wouldn't even know where to start. And, you know, kind of saying that it's okay to uh, invest across country. And so um, that was like super duper helpful for me. Um, but I, I also work in tech, which is another, you know, connection, which was really, really helpful um, in listening to your story. Um, and where I am in real estate is I've been, I think like a lot of newbies, like reading and watching everything for years now. <laughs> so I've been on the sidelines for years. Um, I, a friend of mine introduced me to bigger pockets. I would say like three years ago, I think it was like 2018. Yeah. And when I, um, started looking into everything and started getting really into everything, um, I decided that the best first step was for me to buy a home to live in. And after thinking about like what we would do with it, and um, I was in Washington, DC at the time. Okay. Um, and after thinking about like what we would do with it and everything like that, it was um, like a, a, a four level home. And so we decided to house hack it, huh. um, just a single family, uh, you know, home, but because of how the home was kind of like separated and everything like that, we could live on the lower floors and have like no interaction with anyone else. And and so we decided to do Airbnb and it was really, really great, like to immediately start making money, you know, like yeah. uh, on Airbnb, kind of like lower our, our costs and everything like that. Um, and, but of course, Airbnb requires like a ton of management and, um, you know, uh, and I did everything like on my own. Um, and of course, I also uh, needed to move to the west coast so unfortunately we decided to sell the home i do regret that I, I wish we had never sold and like held on to it um but it is what it is i did take the time to make that decision along with my husband um but anyway i have a market that i have been looking at for the last um year i would say that is just outside of washington dc uh it's in virginia because you know they call that washington area like the dmv so dc maryland virginia they're all super close to each other um and virginia is like a a really good um area depending on where you're going it, it's about like 20 30 minutes out and so um you can go farther down um but virginia is a, a really great area a lot of people who are looking to like you know lower their uh, housing costs are, are moving out of like this expensive like dc area mm. uh and moving there and so i just put in my first offer on friday yay. um and so oh yay <laughs> and so it's a very competitive market yeah um there there is a lot of offers like immediately. And obviously, you know, like a lot of what you've been saying, it's like, there's a lot of um, home buyers who are, who are going to buy this as their primary home. And so that's our competition and that's more true than ever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's been so helpful. Uh, again, I've been looking at this area for over a year. And when I was looking a year ago, the pricing of the homes were literally half of what they are now. Wow. And there's kind of like that regret where, and I'm talking about homes that were like, you know, 50, 40,000, 60,000. Oh, okay. Now they're 120, you know, like, and things like that. So it's not like um, crazy amounts, but it's just like, I, I was looking at it. I was there, but yeah. I had the same analysis paralysis like every other like newbie. Yeah. And I was also looking, you know, in Michigan, I was also looking in like Tennessee, <laughs> I was looking in like all these other places awesome. and I just never did anything. And, you know, a part of me is like, um, timing is so important. Yes. Why don't I just sit this one out too? <laughs> you know, like everyone's talking about this upcoming crash and like when you, and I know I've heard everything you said about yeah. that. That's like highly likely, but it's like when you, you know, come into the market is super important. And, yes. you know, 
it looks kind of toppy and, you know, like I'm coming in at the top, but um, either way, you know, it's been helpful to watch and um, learn everything that you've been saying because I've found a great team uh, in Virginia. And, awesome. you know, when I talk to the realtor about, you know, how I'm looking for yield and how I want to buy, you know, um, below the median, all of these things have been like incredibly helpful to make it look like I know know what I'm talking about I just I guess um the, one of the first things is just like I, I think the difference between maybe newbies and established investors is that we're super nervous about like the timing yeah and thinking we should wait but it, it would be good to hear like you know it seems like you invest through all cycles mm -hmm. And is it just because of the confidence of looking at the numbers? You know, what gives you that, that confidence to know no matter what, <laughs> like yeah. I'm, I'm gonna push through and I'm gonna be investing. Yeah, so that's, so I would definitely wanna get to that answer, but I wanna summarize some of the value that you just gave us in that. Oh, in, amazing. In your, in, yeah, in that intro. Mm -hmm. um, so first off, a lot of folks get sort of lost in the bigger pockets. just area it's right a, oh right it's a lot of information <laughs> yeah it's it's too yeah it's, it's a lot it 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 really promotes something that i hate which is uh, th this idea is better than that idea right i'm gonna go fit mm -hmm. you end up going 50 directions an inch at a time and you never go deep anywhere but right what the real problem in my world is you feel like you're making progress but mm -hmm. you're actually you know, when I look at it, it's like, okay, well, you just wasted eight hours on your Saturday. Congratulations. You did nothing right in my world. It's, it's harsh, mm -hmm. but I've talked to so many people that spend 10 hours, 15 hours on bigger pockets from like Friday afternoon till Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. And what I want to tell people is if, if you're spending more than two, two hours on bigger pockets in a three day period, um, and you know what you want, like you want to be a buy and hold investor, you're probably you could probably use your time wisely. If you're early and you're trying to find your spot, like you don't want it, you don't know if you're interested in multifamily or mobile homes or uh, private, go nuts, right? Real estate investing um, offers lots of options and bigger pockets is at least one, one repository where you can go get a taste of everything. It's like a buffet. But once you say, hey, I'm a meat eater or a veggie eater or uh, mm -hmm. I like desserts or whatever it is, it's time to get off bigger pockets because you can just get you you can get lost and suddenly you you declare you're going to eat vegetables, but suddenly you see a T-bone steak and you're like, ooh, well, maybe mm -hmm. I want steak today. Right. So that's mm -hmm. that's one thing I just wanted to mention again, has its pluses and and its minuses. Kind of same thing for YouTube University. Once you once you declare right. it's it's time to do the work. Second thing, what you've done is you've gone from, hey, I want to be in Virginia to Michigan to this, to having mm -hmm. a spot. That, you, in my world, you can't underestimate the value of that because what you're setting yourself up to is learn, watch, and compound. And oh, by the way, you've already brought it up, your network. You can't really build a network if you're dividing your focus because it's, right. so, who's my contractor? Who's my agent? Who's my, and you, it's, it's confusing. So I didn't want to miss the strong steps you've already made that others may be still struggling with. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So now let's go back to your question, which is how do you have confidence when a market may feel toppy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so first off, I never judge a market, right? I've invested for 20 years um, in, in a market. And if you've read my book, uh, I just, I, I, I pivot when people want to overpay. So what do I mean by that? That sounds like really cocky and arrogant. Well, I've done it twice now, or probably three times in 2007. And I don't know what it is in Virginia. In California, it's published by the California Association of Realtors, car.org. You, because you're in San Diego, you could look this up and, and, and see mm -hmm. what it is for San Diego, for example. I use the affordability index. Uh, so for example, you may want to look this up just because you have access here in California, you can look it up for Fresno. If you go back and look at the historical perspective, which again, the beauty of the affordability index in California is it offers decades of history. So it's like, it's like a rear view mirror 
for what happened. So you'll be able to look at Fresno again, because you can look it up. You're going to see Fresno mm -hmm. for much of 2000 trending in like the 40s and 50s, and then it starts mm -hmm. collapsing. And again, not every market's the same, right? In California, it's from zero to 100, and the lower the number, the worse it is. Some markets are zero to 200, so you have to get the scale for Virginia. I have no idea what it is, but get familiar with California so you can relate it to Virginia later. And what you'll see as the market gets lower and lower, it becomes unaffordable. And what that tells you as it gets close to 20, uh, and in San Francisco, it's close to 10, right? So you have to understand and San Diego is probably mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. But that tells me when a market's getting unaffordable, right? It's like proven. So, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was just wondering, because you said if you're in San Diego, you have access to it. Because I did try and look up the affordability index. Is it some sort of portal that only certain states No, every access? state has their own. Every state has their own, oh, okay. but it means something to you because you'll be able to relate San Diego because Not you a... live there. You'll know mm -hmm. what a 600K house is, where somebody in Detroit right. looking at San Diego 600K house is like, I, that must be a mansion. And we're like, no, it's a shack. Right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so, it's, it's, so if you're in California, well, anywhere... It's car, mm -hmm. C-A-R dot org. Or you can just go to Google and drive, type in California Affordability Index and it will come up. It's a spreadsheet. Got it. And so get comfortable with that. That is what I use to tell okay. me a market is toppy because everybody has opinions. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks every market. I mean, how many people talked about 2020 being a real estate crash? I mean, it was something I fought against mm -hmm. and now they look like idiots. There were people that were supposedly experts saying real estate was going to crash 20% last year. I don't know about you, but it right. didn't crash 20% last year. Um, so I just use affordability. Now, when, once you appreciate and always look historically, like if I was going to go to Virginia, I would look at, I would try to find, and I don't know if it's there. I assume it is because every real estate, every real estate organization wants to publish this because it's useful data to help people buy. I would look at it in mm -hmm. 1990, 95, I would look at it every five years, 90, 95, 2000, 2005, 10, 15, 20, and just figure out where the trend is. Because I don't know about Virginia, but I'm going to guess it had a little bit of a collapse in the last crash. Mm -hmm. I don't know that for sure. I'm just guessing. So if, if that happened, I'd want to look at what the affordability index was in 05, because it was probably high, or, or I guess low in California speak. And then it bounced in 2010 when everybody lost their homes. This is what I would use. And when you look at it in a historical, I mean, decades, it will tell you a story. And somewhere in there, every city I've ever looked at, there's a story to be told and it's in the data. And the affordability index is this single metric that at least gives you a warning flag that we are topping. So let's translate it to right. a market that you can look at and verify what I'm talking about. Fresno, California, the market I'm in. Again, you can go to the car.org, mm -hmm. look up, see what I'm talking about. So in my market, Fresno got all the way down to, I think, 21 uh, during the last, right before the last crash. And then it bounced and it got, went to like over 60. So in my world, when Fresno gets down like under 25, those are like yellow flags. And then if it ever got close to 20 again, that's a red flag, like stop. Mm -hmm. um, so you need and to go stop investing. Well, investing. yeah, like, that's like, like uh, yeah. So like stop. Well, actually it's even worse than stop. It's for me, it's not only stop buying mm -hmm. single family homes, but it's like sell everything. Right. Because uh -huh. I mm -hmm. am, when I buy a rental property, I plan to hold it forever. But Ursula, trust mm -hmm. me, if somebody wants to overpay for anything I own, you can have it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. right. So, I am so confident in that number because I've looked at it every month for 20 years or maybe 15 years mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. it will tell me what to do. And right now, just for clarity, why I don't think Fresno is toppy and most of the country is not toppy is we're sitting at 47 or 48. Mm -hmm. Now that could mm -hmm. all change in a heartbeat. We've already seen interest rates start to go up. We've seen mm -hmm. interest rates up and prices still going. That's a bad combination for affordability, because right. there's only three things that drive the index. It's average income, average price, and interest rate. It's those three things that make the affordability index magical. Because if it ever gets low in California, it means the average person, you and me, can't buy the average home. And that's not okay. Right. Uh, but right mm -hmm. now, half the population can buy it, so it's not a problem. 
Right. And I don't know Virginia, but that would be research I would do. Maybe you're okay. Maybe you're not. No idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think Virginia has a, a long way to go just in terms of looking how fast, like my home, I, I bought my home at such a good price. It still had a three in front of it. And oh, wow. this is like a, a four level home. This is why I was like, I don't what, know. What year? By just curious. Left, Sorry. 2018, oh, February, wow. 2018 is when we bought. And so by the time we left, like it, it was easy 500. Like that's easy. If we had waited even longer because there's so much competition uh, to even get a house. Now you can't even get anything in the worst neighborhoods for like 600 and it looks a mess. And this was like a, um, not new construction, but it was just like completely remodeled home. Yeah, dialed so it's in. just like, you can't even, you can't even get that. But, um, you said sell everything, yeah. <laughs> you know, like when, uh, it gets to that point, do you really mean that? Or do you just mean, well, like, yeah, it's, the, some of that's that, hyperbole. Yeah. Um, right. I'm sure there are things that, you know, there's a, um, cash flow that you wouldn't give up or something like that. So I would definitely, so let's just say, let's say Fresno got to 20, which was the, the low of last period. I guarantee you, I would sell 70 to 75% of my portfolio because again, I'm comfortable. What most people don't get is again, I will, anybody wants to overpay, I'll sell. And unlike other people, I'm okay sitting in cash. Yes. I know inflation's eating my value and blah, 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 blah. But y'all don't realize my best year to buy was 2010. I would love I mean, if I, if I had a magic wand, I would sell mm -hmm. everything again in 2007, sit on the cash for two years and go ham in 2010. I didn't in, know how long the market would go. So I was buying in nine right. and eight and all of that. So let's say everything, um, it, it's like you're getting those sell signals mm -hmm. and you had to, then you're going to sit and then go into Fresno again. Okay. Cause I know you have a mix, like you have like some commercial, you yep. have some, you know, like multi-unit, you have single family homes that are probably the largest part of your portfolio. Would you swap that, that mix in any way? Like more yeah. commercial, like that would bigger. be my, you know, every, like yeah. single family is cool, but should I just go big? <laughs> like yeah. right there. Yeah. So my preference, believe me, I do not like writing checks to the IRS. It's not my favorite <laughs> thing to do. So my preference would be to repeat. <laughs> yeah, plus one. My <laughs> preference would be to repeat um, what I did last time, which was 1031 out of my crazy expensive houses into apartments. Mm. Um, I actually think that is going to be possible again because I think we're about to have some pain in multifamily because of the debt mm -hmm. structure is different and we're in a rising mm -hmm. rate environment and it's just going to make cap rates come down. That's a different conversation. So my preference would be to 1031 again and give the middle finger to the IRS. Mm -hmm. But I want people to hear I would be, if everything is overinflated, everything's to the moon, I would be okay sitting on cash because I'm confident enough in that metric to wait the year or two for it to blow up. Because I, I know the metric. And again, you can look at it last time for him historicals. For, it points at the bubble getting fat. It doesn't mean the pen's going to pop it right away because the market can get mm -hmm. wonky for longer. Mm -hmm. So I really treat in my world, just to break it down, Fresno gets to 25. I sell all my problem properties, which are mm -hmm. probably meaning it, they don't perform quite as well. Maybe they're a little bit too close to the railroad tracks. Maybe they're, you know, C plus areas and I only want to hold B. So I would use a hot market to get rid of problems. And again, 25, mm -hmm. we're at 47, long way to go. And then if it did mm -hmm. get to 20, it would probably unwind. I would probably sell every single family home and then keep my multifamily. Uh, because they really operate in different, different, they don't, I have not seen a market in nearly 20 years that they're both up at the same time. So far, housing goes mm -hmm. up, multifamily's here. Then multifamily goes up housing. Right. And right now we're kind of doing this in my mm -hmm. mind. H housing is getting hotter mm -hmm. because we are seeing urban flight. We're seeing uh, well-paid millennials not want to live in these shoe boxes. They want space for their dogs right. and cars and mm -hmm. stuff. So I think, I think what we're going to see is housing overtake multi. And then my preference would be to sell here and, and move my equity here. But I, I can't guarantee that, right? If they're both up here, I am mm -hmm. okay paying the IRS if I think that something's overinflated. All right. Okay, amazing. While we're on the topic and we touched uh, taxes just a little bit, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask really quickly about um, depreciation because I read that once a, and you tell me if I got this right, once a, uh, property goes, becomes a rental, 
it has 27.5 years of depreciation. And so I haven't read anything else. Like, let's say I, I got a, a house and it's been a rental for 10 years. That means I have 17.5 years left. So it's kind of like, can you buy a, a rental that has no depreciation left? And what happens then? Because oh, so- I, I keep saying this is like so important and one of the number one reasons why people want um, rental. So I'm like, if that doesn't exist, then, you know, why are we doing it? That's a great question. Uh, so actually the clock starts the day you own it. So let's assume you're okay. buying it from somebody who had the rental for 20 years and they only have seven mm-hmm. and a half years left, but you buy it, ownership changes, your clock mm-hmm. starts and your new 27 and a half year clock starts. Mm, okay. That make- Amazing. Makes yeah. Sense. That, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And that, I, I guess I didn't read it that way. <laughs> I thought it was like, you could buy something at the end of the depreciation cycle and then you wouldn't have any. Yeah. So, no, um, yeah. What you may have read, um, there's actually a strategy to mm-hmm. market to owners who have owned their property for 20 plus years because they're probably pretty low on the depreciation, mm-hmm. meaning they don't have a lot left. Some people market to that group on purpose because what mm-hmm. they're looking to market to is somebody who might be open to seller financing. Because what you likely have in a landlord who's owned it for 20 years that they don't have a very big cost basis. So what does that mean? All right. Let's mm-hmm. say the property is worth 400. They've depreciated the property to 100 just to use easy math. Mm-hmm. If they were to sell it outright, they would pay the IRS on the full 300, right? In this gotcha. mm-hmm. But if they did seller financing and where you may have read this is uh, seller financing at 400, you know, you let's just say nothing down. They just do payments. Um, then they they won't pay the taxes on that de- delta, the three hundred, because they have what's called an installment loan. They will only mm-hmm. pay uh, income or taxes on whatever your payment is. Um, that's actually a, a marketing strategy for people who do uh, mailers and cold calling and texting and all of that. You may you may have read something there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Awesome. That's pretty straightforward. Um, I also don't know how much time we have, but um, we have 15 more minutes. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, I guess the next one would just be like a cash flow. Um, I I like how you always say, don't bet on appreciation. And um, I've said that to my realtor because he was like pushing, oh, you're going to get so much appreciation because the market that I'm, I'm in is like, going crazy right now. (laughs) And so, um, but I don't have like a a number in my head about how much cash flow um, I'm supposed to be, yeah, you know, receiving, like in my head, I'm just like, as long as I'm in the positive and and not in the negative. um, And also, you know, I'm doing this for a lot of other reasons, not just um, cash flow, especially when I was looking for duplexes um, at first and multi-units, but these are very expensive in, in the market that I'm in right now. And so it's like, uh, I've kind of, I have to do like a single family. Um, and so I was thinking, you know, like, even if it's 50 bucks, that's great. But is there any number that's, you know, yeah, you I, should for and it's not worth it because yes. the yield is getting tight. <laughs> yeah, so. no, I agree. Yeah. So first and foremost, the most important metric for me is yield, right? I would want to know what the mm-hmm. average yield is in Virginia. And I'm just going to make up a number, say it's 5%. Right, it takes and a while. That's, good. that's uh, accurate. <laughs> yeah, so I've done this before. Um, mm-hmm. so, so let's assume the average yield. And again, you've done the work, so you're ahead of most. My mm-hmm. first goal would be okay. I'm not going to do any deal that's less than six, right? If average is five, mm-hmm. I'm going to bust my ass and do a six, six and a half, seven. Because again, yes, this year has been hard. Yes, last year was incredibly hard. Again, I did 250 offers last year and got nothing. But it, it's mm-hmm. about doing the work, right? And as inventory rises, which we get into the summer, we get out of this crazy health crisis, I expect inventory to rise. I think you're going to be well-informed. Uh, so that's the number one metric. But yes, there is a minimum. I get asked that so mm-hmm. much, I've come up with a minimum. I don't mm-hmm. think it's a good idea to do a deal where you have less than 200 bucks a month cash flow. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's so close to the bone, you know, if it's $200, I mean, you know, one kid breaks one glass window and you're Right. You know, you lose that. Certainly wouldn't do $50. $50 is like, right. you know, just the wind goes the wrong direction and you lose money. I've heard people say that. They're just like, I don't care what it is. <laughs> and yeah, so, yeah, there's a lot of people. Mind, yeah. Yeah. I like to, uh, there's a lot of people that have high, high income jobs. A lot of people in tech, like, like I was and you are, mm-hmm. where they're like, dude, mm-hmm. I have high income. It doesn't matter. I can, I can, I can carry it. 
Mm-hmm. Well, you know what, as I, as I shared in the book, I had a friend of mine who could, who was made a lot more money than me and got all excited mm-hmm. about carrying four or five alligator properties. Mm-hmm. Market turned. Suddenly he was writing payments on things that weren't cash flowing and he ultimately let him go and he never lost his job, but mm. it's just psychology, right? It's, it's one right. thing when you think things are going to the moon, but suddenly when it reverses and gravity takes over and now they're, you know, he bought them for two and they're worth one fifty. suddenly he's not so interested in carrying five. And oh, by the way, in 10 years later, they're worth 300. So if he had held him, he'd have won, but it's just mm. psychology. So no alligators, no negative cash flow. 50 bucks is too close. And again, I appreciate mm-hmm. it. It's hard today. This has been the hardest market I've seen in 20 plus years. I, it's yeah. tough to be starting. <laughs> today. I, I get it. I feel it. I talk to people all the time. Uh, it will turn. Interest rates will go up, which will get more no answers. We'll get um, mm-hmm. inflation, which will, it's, it, they're all cycle. Lending will change and suddenly it'll mm-hmm. go from easy loans to hard loans and it, it, mm-hmm. it just, you just never know. I, I wonder, you know, cause that's, that's great. And it's great that you, you give a number and I don't want to be paying for any property. <laughs> <laughs> so like, that's a, that's a good point. Like uh, I'm really, really careful about what goes out because yeah. um, you did one video, which I thought was so great. How you showed how, I think it was like four different people um, who had different income levels, but yeah. because they were spending differently, it's almost as, as if the income didn't matter. It's just like, it's not what you make. It's like what you keep and how you exactly. spend money. So I'm I thought glad that, you that was like a yeah. fantastic video. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm just wondering now that we're talking about it, you know, some people are newbies and they're making, you know, like an average salary. Some people are newbies and they might have tons of money to mm-hmm. work with, you know? Um, so it's just like, is, is there ever a market that you would say for a newbie, uh, choose another market. I've never, I don't think I've ever heard you say that. Like, for example, my, the market that I've chosen is highly competitive right now, you know, Mm -hmm. and multi offer situations happen like all the time. Like, I I just wonder, like, no matter how much money you have, because it's not smart to just, you know, throw your money because you have it. it, It's like, is there a situation where you would say to a newbie, um, pick another market or this might not be the best place to start. I've never had anybody ask me that question. And you're right. That's something I have an opinion on. Yeah. I think there's probably 10 or 15 metros in the country that frankly don't make sense for one rental at a time. And Mm. they happen to be the highest price markets. I live in one, like the Silicon Valley makes no sense, right? Just no sense. Just (laughs) no sense. Um, San Diego might make no sense, but you know, maybe an hour outside. I don't know San Diego at all. Maybe an hour outside. I'm like, actually surprised at how expensive San Diego is. I thought it was cheaper. <laughs> it's like, it's super expensive. So yeah. 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 So there are, it's probably the 10 or 15 most expensive, like Manhattan, for example, I think right. of. Mm-hmm. Seattle has become that way probably. Um, mm. I don't know. There's, there, it's probably the 10 most expensive metros that might make sense to own. Cause you might want to make a, a life decision to live there, or maybe you work at JP Morgan and you want to be in, I don't know. Right. If your income matches the locale, go nuts. It doesn't make sense as a one rental at a time area, but that still leaves, I don't know, 90%, 95% of the country as possible, but you'll have to be, you'll have to accept different levels. Like Virginia today is 5%. If 5% is average. For some people, mm-hmm. and you'll see it on bigger pockets all the time, they would never invest in a city that wasn't double digits. I mean, the, I'm, I'm not going to judge anybody. If if you found a market, you build a team. For me, the team is important. I hate right. the people that make choices based on Excel because Excel lies, mm-hmm. just flat out lies. So mm-hmm. if you have a team you trust, that is paramount, number one. A great team can make a bad market good, but mm-hmm. a, a bad team can make a great market horrible, Right. Right. Uh, so for me, it's the team, right? Build that, build that, build that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're not, if you pick the market and for whatever reason you've done the work and now you can call me and say, Michael, average is 5%, damn it. My, my mm-hmm. internal clock says I want eight or greater. Well, congratulations. You learned the skill. The market you've chosen and the research you've done says it's five. And if your clock says you want eight, you've got to go somewhere else. But I've, mm-hmm. I've invested in a market that's 6%. And over the course of time, it changes. Like it got as low as five and as high as 15, right? 2010, it was 15%. 
Uh, mm. I chose to stay loyal to the area, the team. Also, I'm a control freak. I want to go see things. I would never, I, yeah. I, no travel for me, right? No airplane travel to see right, my right, stuff. Right. That's my personal choice. Um, right. So yeah, but th those are internal things. But yeah, there are metros that make no sense. Manhattan, San Francisco, mm -hmm. for example. Right. But most of the country is okay if you can live with the average yield. If you're comfortable mm -hmm. with 5% and usually the appreciation that comes with it, go ham. If your internal clock mm -hmm. says you never want anything less than 8%, well, you have choices. If you want double digits, mm -hmm. you have other choices because I don't know what the real average is, but I would guess half the country, maybe maybe 40%, uh, you could build an Excel spreadsheet that says it's 10% or greater, but that comes with all kinds of different risks, all kinds of right. lower appreciation and, and just different things. And yeah, the, but I, yeah, it's a great, I've never had that question. No, yeah, I think, I mean, <laughs> we're in, we're in, you know, interesting times and, and, uh, a lot of different ways so it's just like maybe a couple years ago that didn't matter but at this point um it, it, you know it, yeah. it might i'm, I'm curious because you've been doing the work for a while now and this is just a wild yeah. guess um i'm mm -hmm. gonna guess inventory is up but slightly today so what are we in march versus say november december mm -hmm. it's just a wild guess true or not true you know <laughs> Uh, you know, I would say for me, not true, okay. but also, also I had like some very, very specific, um, like zip codes in mind for, okay. for my area. And then I literally had to just like, forget those. <laughs> there was nothing. <laughs> nothing. There was not. I remember seeing things for like, you know, in the really like hip areas. Cause that's where, you know, of course I'm just like, I only buy like in the yeah. hip areas, you know, I got it. I've had to let that go. And even in like, you know, the boonies, there is nothing. <laughs> and so, um, one thing I will say, though, that has happened in, in doing the, the spreadsheet every day is I'm getting faster and I'm really good nice. at kind of like evaluating deals really quickly, which I it, it, that took a long time because I was like, this is kind of slow going for me. And, you know, I feel what like is this idiot talking what? about. <laughs> right. I'm like, what am I looking at? Like, I honestly didn't understand like what I was looking at. But I, I you know, it kind of went in reverse, like, because I've been looking for so long, there was plenty of inventory. It's like, you know, there's all these things that you can choose from. And then it's like, you know, mm. 10, half of them are pending. Like, yeah. what are you, <laughs> you know, like, what do you even do? And, and so um, I wanted duplexes or multifamilies. There's none, or they're like 600,000. Like it just doesn't, um, it, it's an interesting market. And, and it's a market that's experiencing a lot of growth. Um, if you see all the top 10 lists of like where yeah. millennials are moving, this like that's often makes it so, right. Yeah, that <laughs> right. The, but I'm, people are sleeping on the millennials. I really do think the millennials right. are gonna, the millennials people, I mean, go back and see what the baby boomers did after they came back from World War II. Mm -hmm. I think the millennials are gonna have the same kind of massive in decades of impact. Right. So if you can find that area that millennials are right. like, that's the spot. Right. It's I think fun. it's great that you mentioned this because it's, you know, for years, there's been a lot of people talking about millennials. I'm like, have you ever spoken to a millennial? <laughs> like I'm a millennial, but it's like the things that they say, it's like, this is not true at all. Like they don't want to get married. You know, they don't want a house. They don't want all of this it's stuff. All garbage. It's just like, then they start buying. And I'm like, we've always wanted a house. Like you think people want to live in an, <laughs> like when I moved to San Francisco, seeing like a studio was more than my mortgage was insane crazy like right? yeah. <laughs> I, crazy. I was just like i would never and i immediately was like i would never live here long term and so when everything shut down i was like thank god i can leave I'm out. <laughs> and so it's just like right exactly um but one last question i think we have sure. um time for yeah. is uh I don't, I don't know how much you've talked about this i think you've talked about it a little tiny bit and uh the last newbie that you had which wasn't a newbie at all this guy's like amazing <laughs> but um <laughs> He has used roof stock and everything like that. I wonder yeah. when people are using these kind of like white glove or, you know, um, like services like a roof stock, stock or um, other things that are like turnkey um, housing. Like, is there any way that you would do your, your due diligence? Because, you know, you know, they kind of price it a little higher than, than maybe oh, yeah. uh, it, it could be worth or whatever. Like, I'm thinking, should I you know, talk to a real estate agent in the area to kind of give me their own value on the home or something, or like, is there any due diligence that you would do uh, if you were to work with like one of these? Yeah. So companies? yeah. Turnkey providers. Let's just genericize this, this question around. So first off, turnkey providers are for-profit organizations. 
right? Mm -hmm. They are going to make max dollars and you should assume that going in. They're not going to do you any favors. Right. You, you are one of a hundred people in their minds, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, they don't need a hundred yeses. They need one yes. So just realize <laughs> right. that, that, I mean, that's just the reality, right? So realize they're for-profit organizations. They're not a charity. They will get every last dollar they can. So I think it actually starts mm -hmm. before that. I'm not poo-pooing roof stock or any, any, I don't know. I don't, I've never bought anything on roof stock. I've only looked a couple of times because they've right. interviewed me. So I got familiar. Um, right. I know there's lots of uh, providers out there that do, do turnkey stuff. I would look at the market, do the research and get my own internal valuation. Uh, okay. I don't count. And again, the beauty of the spreadsheet that you have. And again, mm -hmm. I, I use it to write my 250 offers last year. I know what number I can offer to hit my minimum yield. And let's right. be clear of the 250 offers last year, I think less than 20 of them were at listing at list price. Mm -hmm. And that's why I didn't get any counters. I'm just have the confidence right. in my numbers. And again, if something was listed on roof stock, let's say it's in this little hip area and let's just make up numbers. Let's say it's listed at 399, but your math said you couldn't pay more than 379. I wouldn't, I'd offer mm -hmm. 375. I'd come up right. one time to four grand. And if I don't get it, I don't care. My spreadsheet says right. mm -hmm. my minimum yield is acceptable at this number. Right. And I, and I just move on. And that's why you can do 250 offers and get zero and still have ultra confidence in yourself moving forward. The other thing I will point out here on the flip side, I did still do six transactions last year because I told every freaking agent and investor and contractor what I was looking for. Hi, my name is Michael Zuber. I buy three or four bedroom, two bath houses in this market and this condition. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it like has to become your, like your email signature every time you go out. Because again, the six deals mm -hmm. I did all came from my network. Three people I would mm -hmm. call friends or like that just on the edge of friendship. So you would expect to get those. But again, I got three. I got one from a guy I talked mm -hmm. to eight years ago. I'm like, oh my God, you still remembered me? Guess I made an impression, <laughs> right? So yeah. again- Tell that's the, that's something new investors aren't doing and is tell everybody be right. vocal. I mean, frankly, go to the Facebook group for this course and tell people what mm -hmm. you're looking for. You never know where somebody will come in right. and go, Oh my God, my mom or my aunt or my college roommate is selling a house from this or that. You, know, you just never know. Off market deals mm -hmm. were the only deals I successfully closed last year that hit my <laughs> minimum return. Mm -hmm. That sounds amazing. And it, it kind of, I think, speaks to when you stick to a market. Because at first I was like, it's too competitive. I'm leaving. But then I met a really great realtor after like interviewing like a couple people. And, you know, this person works with investors. They, he knows what I'm looking for. Like, and um, he has access to like off market deals and different things like that. So um, when things are better, and they're starting to get a little bit better, but I definitely plan on making a, a trip out there and, you know, just meeting people like uh, in person and kind of like getting a lay of the land because I actually have never been there, even though I lived in D.C. for 10 years and, and was right um, in the area. So, um, but yeah, I, I definitely, I haven't done that uh, again because I keep thinking I need to have everything together and like have the keys and have that photo, like look at me, but... <laughs> Uh, I am doing the work. I'm putting yeah, in the offers, so I don't see why I can't, you know, be more vocal about that and, and tell people. Um, yeah, you know like, what you're like looking, what for. looking you for. You are, I don't know. You're on second base, where a lot of new investors I talk to are like, "Oh my God, we're, they're 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 still stuck in bigger pocket and YouTube kind of mess." Mm -hmm. You've declared. You know what you're looking for. You've already you've already got comfortable. You are so far ahead of most people. It it may not feel it because you're still at zero. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> like that's hilarious. Right. No. Yeah. But now um, but get more vocal. That, right. I, I absolutely I love that. Cause you know, I I like everyone, you're always afraid to say the wrong thing or say you're doing something and then it blows up in your face. But you know, things happen and you know, you've been open about your successes and failures and oh, yeah. everything. But another thing that's so great about your course, one, it's amazingly priced. Like I know a lot of friends who have been doing this stuff. And they're paying thousands of dollars for courses. And after a while, it's like, you know, you better buy something. After you yeah, where's your down payment money? <laughs> down 
Right, exactly. On a home. And so I think your course is like so perfectly priced. Anybody could pay for this. Like, I think even when I was like younger and, you know, really wanted to start doing something, I could have invested. And another thing is like, you filter through the noise. I, I've been watching you since I think the beginning, since you had like just a handful of followers, but it's like, it's, it's really great. Bigger pockets. It's awesome. And I think it's great for someone who's in the beginning, but it's like, yeah. you know, as the platform grows, you don't know who's on there. And so that trust is kind of like not really established. Whereas you, you know, you're, you're building this from the ground up and it's still small. So it, there's not as many bad actors. So it's like, as someone in tech, I already know all about that. <laughs> and so it's like, um, it, it's like you, you filter through the noise and that's important because there's way too many things that you can do. And you're not saying that you can't do that, but you're like, this is what I've done. And this is what I recommend someone do. And I think that that's so helpful. So just tell me the answer. Cause I'm like, which one is it? <laughs> you know? So um, it's, it's been Thank really you. great and, and really, really clarifying. And it's enabled me to kind of go confidently um, to other people and, you know, say what I'm looking for and sound like I, I know what I'm talking about. And they, they take me more seriously uh, because yeah. of that. So. I, so after this, what, roughly 45 minute conversation, I want to tell you a couple of things. First off, mm -hmm. you're a lot closer. Um, I, I'm not even sure I would call you a newbie. Yeah, sure. You're still at zero, but you're confidently making mm -hmm. offers. You know your numbers. You are so close. Yep. All you need at this point is a yes answer. Then, you know, today's a hard time. No inventory markets changing. I think you're going to shock yourself by the summer because I do. I think inventory mm -hmm. is going to go up because I think, I think, I think people are just going to want to get out and move and take advantage of all this right. equity they have. So I think, mm -hmm. I think you're going to surprise yourself. And then the last thing, you're very personable. You're fun to speak with. Mm -hmm. Tell Thank everybody you. what you're looking for, mm -hmm. right? You have one agent that you love that you, yes, treasure that relationship, but yep, go I meet a hundred more. You never okay. know where that one, because again, you have a treasure relationship. They're going to be your go-to person, blah, blah, blah. But if somebody else knew what Ursula was looking for and they had that pocket listing, right. do you want them to call mm -hmm. you? Probably. Yep. Right. <laughs> So that, that's something else newbies do is they go, I got the, I got the, Michael, I don't need yeah. to worry about the agent. I got him. <laughs> well, great. So when, when it's on yeah. the MLS, you know who you're calling. Great. Mm -hmm. How many other agents, Michael, you're not listening to me. I got my agent. Right. No, mm -hmm. you're not listening to me. So when, when I talk to other agents today, I, I'm not mentioning that I have an agent, just saying, Hey, I'm meeting people. Just want to get to know you. I'm no, looking be, for yeah, this. Be very, tell yeah. them what you're mm -hmm. looking for. My name is Ursula. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for these things. If you ever happen to cross something that looks here, that is in this box, right. call me, mm -hmm. Right. send me an email. I, I mean, I don't know what the numbers are. If there were a 10,000 agents there, I'd try to meet a thousand of them in a year. And by meet, it doesn't mean right. like meet, but commute. I would tell mm -hmm. a thousand agents what I know. In Fresno, California, yeah. there's probably 2,500 agents know what I look for. Right. And everybody, That's all amazing. agents That's know, <laughs> all agents know right. that the first one to bring me the deal gets paid. Now, hmm. if, okay. now let's talk about it this way. If I find something online that no agent brought me, there's two or three agents right. I go to because they'll, okay. they're willing to write up Zuber crazy offers and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But again, of the 2,500 agents, all of them know if I find something that fits his criteria, he'll buy it and I'll get paid. That's what you want. Reward hmm. the people that hunt for you. Right. I think that's great because I actually was like reached out to a ton of agents and they never reached back out to me. And now they finally did after I already found an agent. And I was like, thanks so much. I'm working with someone else. And now I'm like, uh oh, I should have been like, <laughs> um, yeah, just take care. Oh, here's what I'm looking for. Exactly. Yeah, and continue talking to them. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Now, yeah, don't, now something awesome. an agent might do is they might try to make you sign some kind of document that says you only work with them. Yes, don't sign I've any of that. those. No, mm -hmm. that's not what yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. You bring me, I pay you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm an equal opportunity yeah. investor and they should take that. Mm -hmm. And if they don't brush them off, mm -hmm. there's lots of agents, right. but yeah, I think that's right. one thing I would tweak is get very clear mm -hmm. on what you're looking. Cause you'll, you'll be so surprised what, what they bring to you. Right. I okay. love it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Keep going. You're so close. You're so close. And I'm yeah. really happy to hear you wrote, you wrote an offer. Uh, that's, that's a huge step forward. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much. All because of one rental at a time. <laughs> I love it. Have a wonderful day. Sure.